on that. So welcome to our info session on GradFlix. My name is Catherine Mabry and I'm the coordinator of postdoctoral affairs and research training in the School of Graduate Studies. So we have with us here today, Sarah Laux and Colin Trinata, who are also going to be sharing their amazing information on GradFlix and what you can do with your research story. And believe me, it is actually really cool information. Um, we're gonna hold questions until the end. I know that we do have a small group. If we have others who are joining us and come uh, in a little bit, that's fine, they can join us in progress, uh, but we'll have all of our questions at the end. And you can feel free to share those as we go along. Um, and then we will answer them after we've gone through everyone's pieces. All right, so let's get started. So in today's session, as I said, we're gonna have an overview of what GradFlix is. Uh, and then we will have uh, Sarah walking us through some awesome information on how to share your story, which is super helpful for our social sciences and humanities folks, but also of great value if you happen to be from any other discipline, because this is just good stuff. Um, and then Colin Trinita is going to walk us through um, some tips on videos. And again, this is applicable no matter what your discipline and then we'll focus on the questions for today. So beginning with our land acknowledgement, McMaster University recognizes and acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. We invite you to learn more about the lands on which you find yourselves and the people who inhabit that land. So in today's session, um, we are gonna start off by talking a bit about what is GradFlix. Uh, and this is a video competition for grad students that was originated at the University of Waterloo. Um, it's an opportunity for you to create a one minute video to share your research story. And this is really your chance to get creative. So unlike 3MT where you would have a static slide that was behind you and you had three minutes to stand there and tell your story live, uh, with GradFlix, you have a lot more flexibility, a lot less time, but a lot less, um, you know, rigidity in the way that you're doing it. You can go ahead and share your story in a number of different ways. We'll talk about what that looks like as we go forward today, but we want you thinking about the different ways you can share, how creative you want to get, um, and what suits your research story. And don't be put off as social sciences and community students. You do have valuable stories to share. And this competition is about communication and creativity. It isn't about having hard research outcomes. Um, it's not about um, having um, hard data in the sense of if you don't have numbers in your discipline or in your research, that's okay. You still have a story to tell. So we're gonna talk about the ways that you can present that information. Your videos must include movement. So this is again, one of the big differences from 3MT. So you'll have either slide transitions, you might have zooming in and out on a subject moving. Um, you could have people moving in your scene. You could have live video that you shot. Um, anything you can pretty much imagine. Stop motion, that's a great one. Um, animation, these are all options, but you will have some kind of motion. You'll also have sound, whether that is voiceover, whether that is sound effects, music. Uh, it could be um, anything you like. You could sing, you could rap about your uh, research if you wanted to and were so inclined. Um, any of this is all possible with grad books. So in terms of eligibility, um, grad students must be registered in a master's so either one with a major research project or a thesis um, or a PhD program with your dissertation. Uh, the videos must focus on the research that you're conducting for your thesis, your MRP, or your dissertation. So if you have other projects that are equally cool but are not your actual focus for your uh, program, unfortunately, that's not what you're gonna be focusing on. It's going to be what you are doing for your thesis your MRP or your dissertation. That's what you're gonna be focusing your grad books on. And since you're putting so much time and effort into this, we want you to share what's cool about it. Your videos must be able to be made public 
our video finale will be hosted on YouTube live. And so we need to make sure that all videos are going to be able to be shared by social media. So if you're working with a research partner, um, you might want to check with your supervisor before entering into this process, just to make sure that everything is okay for you to be able to share. In terms of the rules, we've had some adjustments that we've made this year because it's our second year and we've um, had the opportunity to see what we need to do. So as I said, your videos will focus on research um, and you have 60 seconds, a maximum of 60 seconds to tell your research story. In addition to that 60 seconds, you'll have a frame or two uh, where you will include citations for all of the materials that you use in your GradFlix video. So whether that is stock photos or uh, background footage that you've shot or stock footage that you got from uh, one of the sites that's recommended, um, doesn't particularly matter what it is. Uh, music included here too, um, sound effects, uh, any of those pieces, you're going to include them so that we are ensured that everyone is abiding by all of the regulations of copyright uh, and that we don't have any issues there. Video content must be original. So um, again, you can use stock footage that is available to you under um, Creative Commons licenses. That's all fine. Um, that's why we have the citation at the end, uh, but it must be um, available and or uh, original that you have shot it and not someone else, because the submission should be the creative work of one individual, you. This is your research story. And so we want all of the work to reflect your vision. There's only one submission per competitor um, and you only get one try. So make sure that you are investing enough time in it uh, so that you have the opportunity to submit your best grad flex. Uh, and the decision of the judges is final. We've adjusted our judging criteria a little bit this year as well. Um, so we're going with 40% communication. Um, so your ability to explain complex ideas to a non-specialist audience or think about explaining your social sciences or humanities topic to someone from one of the STEM disciplines. You know, would they be as familiar with all of your ideas or concepts as you are? Probably not. So you want to make sure that they'll be able to understand exactly what it is you're trying to tell them and why it's important. Creativity and visual impact is also 40%. So an equal weighting. This is about how you're presenting your information, whether that happens to be in animation or stop motion or a live uh, video. It could be anything that you can imagine. Um, we've seen a lot of examples lately. We've been watching a lot of videos. And if you can figure out in your mind what you think would be really cool, we're pretty sure that you're gonna be able to do it. Um, so it's about how you present your information just as much as um, the way that you are communicating the message. Okay? And remember, it is about the value of your research in terms of um, what its meaning is and why you see its importance and okay? not about outcomes, not about research outcomes at all. And finally, the last 20% is technical quality. And this is about the effective use of images and sound. Um, are you filming in the right mode? So whether it should be um, portrait or landscape mode, um, depending on the platform that you may ultimately want to upload your video to. Um, are you uh, able to hear what's being said or anything that's important? Um, can you see everything clearly? and also uh, the citations. And we have also added the requirements that everyone provide us with a full transcript for your videos. So AODA compliance is required and we are requiring everyone to go ahead and provide us with a transcript. All of the um, comments that are in your video, all of the text, and then we will go ahead and caption that for you. So. That is all included in technical quality. So participating in GradFlix, you can win a number of prizes. So first prize is 1,000, second 500, third is 250, and the People's Choice is $250 as well. The top three winners will receive the Dean's Award for Excellence in Communicating Graduate Research, 
And if you are interested in seeing those folks, they are currently posted on our grad awards page on the graduate studies website. Um, and you can also watch uh, their videos if you go to the GradFlix page on the Grad Studies website, and there is a link to that playlist. So if you're wondering why you should participate, um, as you know, social sciences and humanities people, I'm going to encourage you that this isn't just a chance to learn a new skill, it's a chance to learn a whole new set of skills. It's really an opportunity to go ahead and develop out those additional pieces that are going to help you to stand out, whether you plan to stay in academia or go beyond. So if you're thinking about maybe you might like to go for a tenure track or a teaching track job and stay in academia, well, sooner or later, someone's going to ask you to teach something. And if you look at what's been happening during the pandemic, people have been having to teach remotely and package their information in new and engaging ways. Well, you know, practicing with GradFlex gives you the chance to develop out some skills that you can translate to the classroom. And that will stand you in good stead when you are on the academic market. If you're looking to go beyond campus uh, and to work in any other aspect, the ability to uh, demonstrate strong communication skills and digital skills are not gonna hurt you either. Those will be well received. It's also an opportunity for you to expand your network connecting with students from other disciplines and talking about your research, um, great opportunity. Uh, you'll broaden your communication skills in general, and you'll be able to get some feedback uh, from we have coaches available, uh, and we have other uh, folks who are interested and willing to share their expertise. Um, you'll be able to introduce your research to a new and broader audience. So if you're ever thinking about applying for grant funding or uh, raising awareness of whatever it is that you research, it's an excellent opportunity to do that. And you'll be able to use your video for other research competitions like Shirk Storytellers. So we encourage you to be thinking about some of this. And of course, you'll be able to win cool prizes too. So in terms of competition dates, the deadline to register is February the 25th. Now that's really just an intent uh, for you to say, hey, I am going to submit a GradFlix video. You don't need to submit your video at that point in time. The deadline to submit the videos is March 11th. So between the 25th and the 11th, we will have uh, folks on campus that you'll be able to connect with um, to get uh, feedback for various parts of your video, to ask questions, maybe to get some help on pieces that you've been working on. Um, so that's going to be available for people who have indicated that they are planning to submit their videos. Preliminary judging begins on March 15th, and the final showcase happens on April the 5th on YouTube Live. So we have a number of resources available to you. Uh, the answer to all things is to start by going to the Grad Studies website uh, and going to the GradFlix page. We have pretty much everything hyperlinked in there. Um, so that includes uh, resources like a video from Elaine Westenhofer uh, from Lions New Media Center, where she walks you through various aspects of, um, you know, how to script things out and package it out. Um, you can see we've got um, John Bandler. He is a volunteer coach um, who has worked with a number of our graduate students in 3MT and Bradflix. John has a session that he is delivering with Megan Bierhout um next week on february the 8th and you can register for that they also had a podcast uh, i believe that aired a few hours ago today um so that should be available on cfmu as well um john is happy to work with people individually or in groups so you can definitely be getting feedback from him um he's more than happy to connect with you um so I encourage you to take advantage all right and now uh, we are going to hear from Sarah Laux, the Manager of Communications in the Faculty of Humanities. I'm going to stop my share here. And Sarah, it is all over to you now. All right. Well, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share some tips, just general storytelling tips. I am not the technical video creating person. Colin has all sorts of stuff about that. But I do have some basic tips about making your research interesting to other people in a minute. So let me share my screen. And all right. 
So can everybody see that? Okay. Yes. Give me the thumbs. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> so some storytelling tips. And to start off, let me give you some basic ideas about what makes a story sticky. This is from a, a really good book about marketing, but it's actually super useful for storytelling. And it's called Made to Stick by two researchers named Chip and Dan Heath. Um, so a sticky message, so something that people remember, people think is cool, has this very kind of basic uh, acronym to it, success, if you spell success wrong. Um, but the best kinds of stories are simple, which is not always easy when you're talking about academic research because academia tends to be filled with jargon and all sorts of language that is complicated. So if you wanna make your story memorable, you need to make sure to make your language as plain and focused as you possibly can. So unexpected. So something that's gonna make your reader go, huh, I didn't know that. Let's say you were doing a research project on Verdi and his role in Italian unification, uh, which is a project I actually did. Um, you know, you might want to start that off with Verdi couldn't actually speak Italian. That's not true, but you know, maybe he spoke Phoenician. Who knows? But you want to start something with with some that'll make people sit up and go, "Oh, I didn't know that." So concrete, something that is factual, try to get out of the abstract of saying, you know, my research is really interesting. Well, what does interesting mean? Show me, tell me why it's interesting. Don't just kind of say that it's abstractly interesting. And you can do that by providing facts and sources. You are the authority on your research. So make sure that the information you provide is credible and backed up with research citations. And as Catherine said, you have a place for citations at the end of your presentation. And then emotional. So something that hits people in the feels uh, in one way or another. You can be funny, you can be sad, but it's a good idea to try and make people feel something. And then story driven. We keep talking about a research story. People love to hear stories. And so it's a really good idea to try and figure out a narrative for your research, a beginning, a middle, and an end for your, for your presentation. You've only got a minute, so it's going to be a really short story. So here's some ideas about how to present complex or abstract research. And, and humanities and SOCSI research tends to be complicated and also abstract. And sometimes it can be hard to get people into it. So I'm gonna show you a little clip from an online lesson on interpreting a poem's main theme and ideas, which is kind of an abstract concept, but they do a really good job of introducing the idea with a story. So we're gonna to switch to a different screen. And... I'm going to share my sound. <laughs> it's always good to remember these things. There we go. All right. And we will take a listen to, we're just going to see a little bit of this. We're not going to watch the whole thing. Imagine you've just stepped out of the movies. You and some buddies went to see the latest sequel in a superhero franchise. You spot another friend in line for tickets. She quickly asks you, what was that movie about? You tell her in your best movie trailer voice, The hero faces incredible odds and inspires his city to join his fight against crime. With a snarky grin on her face, your friend says, So what did you learn from this cinematic journey? Unfazed, you fire back, One motivated man can be the catalyst for change. Okay, so maybe you don't talk like this with your friends. Well, you get the idea. <laughs> and I'm going to switch back to my presentation. I didn't manage this the first time I did the presentation, so I'm kind of impressed with myself right now. Okay, so that was a really good way of kind of presenting your research ideas in a story kind of thing. And as soon as you use a story, everybody can relate to it. So I really encourage you to think about how can you tell the point of your research with a story. So. The next thing to do is to figure out your research. What's the so what? So are you helping to build um, an overall understanding of the role of Verity in Italian unification? Well, that's great because you're contributing overall knowledge. 
What do you find cool about your research? If you're passionate about what you're studying, then other people are going to pick up on that and they're going to go along with you wherever you're going to take them. One good way to try and do this is to explain your research to your best friend or your grandmother or your neighbor across the back fence. Somebody who isn't familiar with your discipline that you have to get really simple and explain what you're doing in the simplest possible way. That is a really good way to start a 60 second video. And when it's appropriate, use a little bit of humor. It's okay to be funny if your topic can stand that. Some people's topics can, but in general, if you can be funny, it's okay to be a little funny. All right. And a good way to kind of focus your thinking about the focus of your video is to write yourself a grabby headline. So we see a lot of academic writing. Whoops, we want to go back. We see a lot of academic writing with titles like Grasshopper and Locust Farming as a Sustainable Source of Protein for Non-Ruminant Livestock and Humans in Kenya. That's not going to fly in a 60 second video because that's taken up like 30 seconds of your 60 seconds already. So a much simpler focus, eating bugs. So think about that. Think about a question that might lead people into your research. Who did kill Roger Rabbit? Try positioning it as an explainer. So I'm going to take you through the steps of blah, blah, blah. Or maybe you're going to tell them again something unexpected or something audacious, like this man will want you to make you study stats, which I can say is an impossibility, um, but it'll get people's attention. And then something vaguely clickbaity, and that's okay. McMaster's new health physicist has a weird hobby. We actually wrote this story, and his weird hobby is collecting radioactive objects like glass and medicines. And anyway, it was a fun story to write, but it got people in right away because we already knew what the focus of the story was, and it was an interesting way to get into it. So you're working in a visual medium, and you may have research that's not entirely visual. So here are some ways to present your research in a way that will lend itself to a visual medium. So animations are great, as you saw in the example video, and I will share a couple more videos um, that show you exactly how animations can be used. You can use stock photos in a slideshow. Stock photos aren't hard to find, slideshows aren't hard to put together, and Sometimes that's the best thing. If, if you don't have the technical skills, then photos and talking and some interesting text is probably going to be your best bet. A really nice thing about humanities and social sciences research is it lends itself to using archival photos. And that's something that we don't often see. So it would really make your presentation stand out. Um, archival photos, old maps, any kind of historical documents could be really, really interesting. Uh, visually appealing text. So, you know, if you're defining something or you're explaining a complex concept, it's okay to put text on the screen. Just make sure it's visually interesting. And sound. Colin's going to talk about sound as well, but I'm, I'll preface it by saying sound effects and music are super important because they actually loan a lot more to the mood of your presentation than you might think. Sound effects, especially if your visuals are a little more static, Sound effects can really help and you can find them on the web. It is not hard to find sound effects. And you can also find stock music that will go in the background of your video. All right, so how do we do this? Part of the best way to kind of start your plan and set up your video is to talk it out with someone. Talk to someone about what you're doing, about the important points that you might wanna convey and then make a plan. You know, you draw a diagram, you can doodle, you can rough it out in longhand, whatever, just a rough plan. And then you can create a formal storyboard. So I want this image to be here, I want this image to be here, and it's going to lead in here, and these are the transitions I'm going to use. And then write your script, read it out loud. It's really important to do that so you find out, A, whether it's too long, but also whether it's easy to read and simple enough. You'd be surprised what you discover when you read words out loud. And be ruthless in cutting out everything you don't need because you only have 60 seconds. So you have to be super careful about what words you include. All right, so here's a good example, and this is from Oxford University. They have a whole page of research impact videos, which I think is fascinating, but this is a really good 
example of kind of finding a theme for a video and carrying the theme all the way through. This animation may be beyond your capabilities, but it's a good thing to aim for. So let's take a look at this. Most armed conflict is not about states locked in war, with the number of soldiers left all that matters. Often the groups that make the difference between war and peace don't fit this picture. To understand these forces, Oxford's conflict platform and ConPeace teams use everything they can, including photographs, interviews and focus groups, army doctrines and historical battle data, and forums and workshops to investigate how and why conflicts change over time and how societies can move towards lasting peace. Governments and international agencies often contact the teams to learn about their findings, and the UN has updated its guidance on non-state armed groups to reflect the new knowledge. It also informed the Colombian government's strategy around its peace agreement with the FARC in 2016. Social science might be about qualitative and quantitative data, but it's also about saving lives. All right, so one good example. I have one more example from Oxford to show you, and then that will be the end of my presentation. Take a look on putting ancient Sicily on the internet. A lot of important information has been carved in stone over the years. But a lot of it is difficult to read because it's written in ancient languages, it's been damaged by the elements or by people, or it's just really hard to move around. For two decades, an Oxford academic has been studying ancient Sicily, working with local museums to record, translate and display over 4,000 items in an online stone library. This needs more than just one person, so Sicilian school children have been involved as citizen scientists, locating, cleaning and photographing objects, and even developing an exhibition in a local museum. So check out the fascinating history of this hotly contested island on your computer. Or perhaps more appropriately, a tablet. I would say that's an excellent use of a sound effect. <laughs> All right. That is the end of my presentation. I'm going to stop my screen sharing. And I think it is now on to Colin. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Colin Chineda, Digital Media Specialist with Factory Humanities. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, video uh, and how you might uh, employ it in uh, your presentation. So let me queue up my PowerPoint. That's ready to go. And Uh, let's start. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see the PowerPoint presentation. I think it's working all right. All right. So um, I intentionally set out to make this uh, a non-technical guide. So I'm not, I'm not going to do any tutorials or anything, but I am going to give you some information that uh, hopefully will steer you in the right direction for your presentation. Um, and so starting with um, what your submission can be. So we know it can, from the the uh, contest rules, it can be a video, it can be a moving slideshow or an animation. Um, for moving slideshows and animations, uh, I, I actually throughout this whole presentation, I'm going to be encouraging, you know, using the simplest tools uh, and the ones that you already have access to. So um, something like PowerPoint or Google Slides can actually be used um, to create a video and create a, a uh, presentation with uh, some um, basic uh, animations and, and other um, interactive elements throughout. And um, it's actually not too hard to do. It's just not everybody knows about it. So uh, I've got a link uh, and I, I'm going to um, um, make sure that the PDF is available so that you can you know, click it. But Microsoft has uh, a tremendous amount of uh, tutorial information and you can, you can just Google it as well. Um, about how to use PowerPoint in a presentation, how you can record a video um, and uh, you know do a voiceover and that kind of thing, and then save it all as a video file. Um, so uh, it's worth considering as you uh, embark on this and you look at some of the the tools and technology that's available to you. Um, the most of the rest of my presentation is going to be focused a little bit more on what happens if you are going to try and do a video. So. With that in mind, uh, I want to talk about gear, and, and I really like my gadgets and, and, and gear and that kind of thing. So um, uh, I enjoy talking about the, uh, this element. 
And again, uh, I'm aiming at, you know, what is the simplest and easiest way and what are the most accessible tools that you can uh, get your hands on to, to do this. So um, if you have uh, access to and you feel comfortable with you know, using, um, you know, a, a, a higher end camera or, you know, a, a hybrid uh, mirrorless uh, setup or something like that, then uh, by all means, uh, go for it. But if you don't, and most people don't necessarily have access to that, uh, there are other tools available to you. And, you know, the, the web camera that you have in your, um, uh, in, in most laptops or the, the cameras that you have on, on your smartphone are more than enough to, to be able to put together a quality presentation in many cases. So um, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about what you could potentially do with, with your smartphone. So um, you can use all kinds of different methods to uh, set up uh, your recording area. And you may end up deciding to do this indoors or outdoors, depending on uh, what your objectives are. But I did want to throw in before I move on from gear that there are some optional you know, accessories that you might want to think about using. Uh, a tripod, uh, if you can get access to one uh, with a smartphone attachment, uh, which can be just screwed into it. Um, that can be really helpful in terms of, you know, setting it up so that it's a nice, smooth, and stable uh, image. Um, you could use a, a cell phone stand. I've seen those become kind of popular with you know, this uh, uh, distanced uh, uh, virtual world that we're all living in at the moment. So uh, that's something to, to look at. Or, you know, if, if you're looking for something a little more specialized, a little more flexible, Something like uh, the Gorillapod uh, mobile mini, and I've got a, an image there, is a little mini tripod that you can get for about $25 Canadian. Um, and uh, you can attach your smartphone to it and then use the flexible legs to attach it to a tree branch, to sit on your table, um, you know, grab onto a, a bookshelf, what have you. So uh, there, there's, those are some options that are available to you as you um, undertake this. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is sound, and uh, I wanted to make sure that was one of the first uh, pieces that I talk about because uh, it, it long been accepted that you can have an okay looking presentation or, or video or whatever, but if your sound is bad, then it becomes really inaccessible to the people who are uh, listening in. So you want to make sure your sound is, is good. It doesn't have to be award winning. Uh, but it, you know, you want to make sure it's nice and clear uh, and easy for people to to listen into. So once again, you know, using the microphone that's built into your laptop or you know into a smartphone for the most part will will do you know good work. Um, and we should be loud and clear enough to be able to hear. Um, so uh, to make that a little bit easier on those devices, there are some tips that I can give you. And so starting with you know, make sure you try and isolate your environment a little bit um, and make sure that there's there's little in the way of background noises. They're almost impossible to get rid of entirely, but, you know, if you can avoid, you know, loud noises from fans or furnaces, uh, pets, uh, other people in your house, that kind of thing, then that, that definitely helps uh, your cause out. Um, you also want to think about the environment that you're recording in. So, you know, if you're in one of the one of uh, the many offices uh, on campus, uh, some of them are not great recording environments because they are uh, they're small. They have hard surfaces. They don't have carpets or a lot of furniture in them, and they can generate a lot of uh, reverberation reverb um, from when you're speaking. So when you talk and those sound waves uh, come out, they're going to hit those surfaces, and then they're going to come bouncing back to the microphone. Like, and ideally, you don't want to, to do that because it can be quite distracting to someone listening in. So, um, you know, finding a space that has, um, you know, uh, some soft surfaces, carpets are great, furniture, you know, anything to kind of dissipate that, that noise, um, the, the, the reverberation effect, that, that usually is a good thing. And then if you do decide that you're going to record outside, uh, then, um, yeah, and I've done this many times for, for the work that I've done, um, you do need to think about some extra um, elements. So you need to think really hard about and, and listen in uh, for background noises. So is there a construction site nearby that's gonna potentially make some noise? 
Are there trucks that are backing up and have the, the, the beeper on to let people know that they're backing up? Th those can really ruin a video. Uh, it certainly, you know, caused me to have to go back and, and do another take or, or something like that. So um, you definitely want to think about those things. You also want to think about the wind. So if you can find a nice calm day, or if you can find a spot where there, there's some shelter from the wind, so that you don't get that over the microphone effect, uh, which can be, you know, really distracting and, and make it difficult to hear. Um, those are definitely good things to, to uh, consider. Uh, and then I want to talk about composition. So, um, and, and this will depend a little bit on what you intend to do. Um, and I, I said uh, in my other session, and I'll say it here as well, uh, all of these rules in, in some cases are meant to be broken, but you, you need to break them with some intention uh, in mind. So uh, if your intended audience is going to be viewing it on a computer or a laptop or a television or something like that, then what you really want to do is record with, with your smartphone on its side. So you want it like this as opposed to this. And that will you know, stretch your image out in a landscape instead of in that vertical portrait uh, style. And that will uh, make it easier to see on those uh, devices. Um, and you know, most platforms, that is the preferred method. The exception, of course, is if you were uh, doing a video that was intended for uh, you know, Instagram or TikTok or something like that. So um, by and large, you probably want to record in that landscape mode. Uh, and then there's also composition within the frame. So you want to make sure that you center yourself in the frame of your video, uh, you know, with your forehead kind of in the top one third of the frame. So a bit like how I'm, I'm sitting now in the presentation or how I've got in, uh, in, in the graphic. So, you know, making sure that that's up there and I'm kind of filling this space, you know, with a little bit of room on the top, um, just to make sure that it doesn't feel too cramped. Uh, but you, in most cases, you're not going to want to do this. So, you know, if I'm off over on the side, then that is, uh, you know, it's a bit more uncomfortable, unless you have intention in mind. So I put a little asterisk and I said, unless you plan to fill that space somehow. So, you know, if you were intending to put some talking points in there or a graphic or something like that, then then uh, then there's a reason for you to do it. And then you have an intention behind it. But in most cases, you wanna make sure that, you know, you're centered in the image. So you don't wanna, you don't wanna do that. So, you know, we've all seen someone in a presentation where they've got their screen and all you can see is like, you know, part of them or just their forehead. Uh, that's not ideal. So you don't wanna do that. And you don't wanna do that. Um, and then uh, you also want to think about what's in the background. So you need to think about what is around uh, you as a speaker. So uh, check and make sure, you know, if there's um, if there are things in the background that you've had a look at them and you make sure that th those things are okay to be in your background. Um, in general, you want to try and find a simpler background so that there's fewer things to distract. Uh, but, but then, you know, you may need to, uh, place yourself in front of something for context, in which case it makes sense uh, for it to be there. If you need to be in front of a building, uh, if you want to be in front of a bookcase, you know, have a look and see what's in the bookcase. You always want to uh, double check these things before you uh, do your recording. And then uh, there's also lighting to consider. So um, it's generally good, especially in, in, with a presentation, that you uh, make sure that your face is fairly well lit. Uh, and there's a bunch of different ways that you can consider that. Um, if natural lighting is available, um, you want to make sure that your face is angled towards the light. So today I'm actually pretty uh, fortunate because uh, even though it's cloudy out, there's a lot of snow on the ground and there's a lot of reflected light coming in from the window that's just over here. So, so my face is fairly well illuminated. You want to aim to you know, make it, uh, take advantage of that. Uh, what you don't want to do is you don't want to ha have yourself in front of that bright source of light. So you don't want to be in front of a window. You want to be facing the window uh, if you're going to work with, with, with natural light. Um, if you're working with artificial light, then you want to uh, have uh, some of the light angled uh, you know, towards your face so that it's evenly lighting you. Um, but you also need to keep in mind that you don't want to uh, overdo it. So if you use a flashlight, that could uh, overpower um, your features and you kind of get lost in, in the brightness. So I'll talk about that in a second, uh, about some uh, mitigating uh, techniques that you, you can uh, use in that situation. 
So the other thing you want to consider is shadows from above and below. So uh, generally, you want to have the light coming sort of straight onto your face uh, and not casting sort of shadows vertically um, on some of your features. Unless, again, you have intention to do that. So, you know, the classic uh, uh, flashlight um, at a campfire to create kind of a spooky look where the, you know, the light is coming up from uh, beneath. You know, maybe you have a reason to do that in your presentation. Um, in which case, yeah, by all means, go for it. But in, in most cases, you know, you want to make sure it's, it's generally even, evenly lit on your face. And I already talked about, you know, making sure that a uh, bright light isn't behind you. Okay, um, and I wanted to talk about a couple of lighting uh, techniques because these you can do with things around the house and they're fairly simple to set up. So um, one popular uh, lighting style is known as Rembrandt lighting. Um, and uh, to do it, you need your camera uh and you of course and then two light sources so um in my graphic i used lamps because you can easily make use of a lamp uh or some kind of light that you've got around the house um and then all you need to do is make sure that it is positioned so that it's lighting part of your face with the one lamp uh and then if you've got a second lamp move it a bit further away and at, a, at an angle uh and then it lights the other side of your face and it fills uh, in the gaps. It's actually quite natural uh, looking for, for most people, and that's why it's, it's a fairly popular portrait style. Um, you also don't have to use a lamp. Uh, you could use a, a sheet, you know, a bright sheet or a white sheet. Um, you could use uh, a bright piece of paper, a couple pieces of paper taped together. Um, if you've got a mirror, you could use a mirror instead of a light. There's all kinds of different ways that you can achieve this effect with just you know things that you you've got around the house. So um, it doesn't have to be uh, an expensive um, uh, reflector or anything like that. It can be quite simple to do. The other style is is called butterfly lighting, and this is even simpler. So you know you have your camera set up, it's pointed at you, and then you have uh, the light uh, pointing you know, essentially straight on at you and it, and it is lighting your features that way. So you can, you can certainly do that. Um, one of the ways that uh, you could also do something like this is, um, you know, if you didn't uh, have a, a lamp, but uh, you did have a couple of flashlights kicking around, um, you could use a flashlight. And, and I said earlier, you don't want to shine the, the flashlight directly onto you. So you may want to consider trying to bounce the light off of something else, again, a sheet, a piece of paper, uh, that can help create a more natural uh, uh, look. Uh, or, you know, I've, I've also, in a pinch, I've, I've even um, done some product photo uh, uh, photography where I took uh, a flashlight and um, a piece of string or a rubber band and a piece of toilet paper or a couple of pieces of toilet paper uh, or paper, paper towel um, and put it over uh, the flashlight to soften the uh, the look of the flashlight. That can actually that can you know uh, work just as well as an expensive um, filter. So uh, it's uh, again something you can do without having to spend a lot of time or, mo or money on. Uh, and then you know my other suggestion on lighting is to make sure that you experiment. You may need to try a couple of different ways before you find the one that works in your space. Um, and then just make sure you're happy with with you know how it looks. So do a couple of tests, test shots, and have a look and, and make sure that you're happy. You know the, the more preparation you can do ahead of time, the the easier it gets when it comes to doing the presentation itself. So yeah, those are those are some of my tips on how to approach this from a technical standpoint. Um, you know. In general, be comfortable in your recording space. Whenever I do sessions with uh, with uh, faculty members or students, I try and get to, you know make sure people are are, are happy and comfortable in that area. Uh, take your time doing it. Check your work after you've recorded it. Make sure you listen in. Everybody hates to hear themselves, but it's good to listen and make sure you know there isn't a background noise that you didn't hear when you were presenting. Um, that there wasn't a truck backing up and you just kind of tuned it out. You need to uh, check these things before you. Uh, are ready to go. So, you know, uh, definitely do that. And that should, you know, get you to your end result, which is success. And I have the success kid meme. So good luck. Uh, and hopefully this uh, helped you out. 
Thank you so much, Colin. Um, you know, it's just as helpful the second time that I've heard that. Um, one of the questions that I that I had thought about um, is: Is there a difference between filming with your phone or filming with a tablet? Um, you know, can you get the same results? I, I, I mean, you might have a newer tablet at your disposal than your phone, or vice versa. Um, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, I oriented that to, uh, towards smartphones, but there's not really much of a difference. Most modern tablets have you know the same camera technology built into them. I mean, I think ninety five percent of the tablet market is is uh, is iPad, um, and you know modern iPads are actually intended as you know, being kind of a video editing and creating uh, device as well. So their cameras are generally speaking just as good or almost as good as the ones on the flagship iPhone. Um, so yeah, you could absolutely do it with a tablet. You know, in some cases that's easier because you've got a bigger screen, you can see, you know, more easily what you're doing. Um, there are um, holders that you can get for tablets, um, for tripods if, if you want to use that. Or um, you could also, um, you know, you could prop it up. You could use a stand. There's, there's, there's options for, for working with a tablet too. Thanks so much. It's, it's so great to know. Um, just if, uh, you know, work with what you have. Start with what you have. Yeah. Um, I think is the, is the big takeaway. Um, and just as a reminder, because I don't think I said earlier that the uh, Lions New Media, um, has uh, spaces available for you to work on some special pieces. So if you wanted to do some green room, uh, green screen filming, um, they have that available for you as a space that you can book. Um, so you can do uh, some fancy stuff there. And there's also um, the audio um, recording space. So if you wanted to do uh, voiceovers and you, know, you couldn't find a space uh, in your home that didn't have some kind of background noise. I know the room that I'm in has uh, a fan and I've done recording before and it's the most awful thing to try and get rid of the sounds. Uh, so if you find yourself in that place, it's okay. Uh, you can go ahead and use the space in the uh, Lines New Media Center uh, and that's available too. And then they also have computers that are available for you to use. Um, so, you know, do feel free to make use of the, uh, the technology that they have available for you, especially as we're returning to campus. Um, it was different when uh, everyone was like all alone, uh, but now that we're returning to campus, you know, feel free to, uh, to make use of the resources that you have available. So thank you so much, Colin and Sarah. Um, now that we've, uh, you know, we've got all this, I, I've got ideas, I swear I want to do my own grad flags. Um, so we're going to uh, open it up uh, for questions at this point, um, if there are any questions. By the way, if you don't have questions, it's okay too. <laughs> no questions, okay. All right, that's perfect. All right, well, if you do have questions at a later point in time, you can feel free to, uh, to email us and we'll pass them along uh, and help you connect and get answers. Um, but thank you both so very much. Your information is so helpful, um, much appreciated. And um, I think that it's a great value to our students uh, making those grad flex videos or any videos. Um, yeah, I know I'm inspired now. I have no reason to make a video. I just, I wanna do it. It sounds like fun. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'm sorry, Colin. Oh, is it happy to help? <laughs> well, we're so glad to have you on board and, and we will take advantage of your generosity. <laughs> All right, so thank you everyone for joining us. Remember, if you have any questions about uh, GradFlix going forward, uh, you can visit the website for the School of Graduate Studies and go to the GradFlix page. That will have all the information and links and resources there, as well as a contact form so that you can submit any questions you have or come directly to us and then we'll be able to get you the information that you need. So registration deadline is February the 25th and uh, make sure that you register before then. And we are looking forward to seeing what you do. We wanna hear your research stories. So 
thank you so much for joining us and uh, good luck with your grad flick.